Thank you, Mike. Yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm Catherine Zucker. I'm a Hubble Fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about supernova driven star formation on the surface of the local bubble um, and how we've understood that by reconstructing the star formation history of everything near the sun in our Milky Way galaxy. Um, so I know mostly in this room are cosmologists and particle physicists, so feel free to interrupt me at any point um, for terminology. I'll try to walk through it. Um, but yeah, I welcome questions um, throughout the talk. I also want to thank all my wonderful collaborators. Um, you can see listed here, particularly Alyssa Goodman and Joel Alves, um, who were some critical co-authors on this paper, uh, which was published in Nature um, earlier this year. So I'm just gonna. Uh, there's like to... a. I have to consent to the recording really quick. Okay. I'm trying to find my mouse. You might have to get out of full screen to do that. Yeah, I think I will. Actually, I might need technical support. That's, that's me. I'm glad, I'm glad we have all this recording. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, you don't have any mouse? Oh, oh there it is. Oh, it. Somewhere. It's invisible, though. It is invisible. Should I? Great. Can I not just press <laughs> Oh, there oh. we go. Okay, perfect. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> uh, and right, right on time, here are some collaborators on this work. This is Alyssa. Um, she was the co-author. And then this is Micah. And he helps make, uh, he's going to help make a lot of the cool three visualizations, uh, some of which I'll show up today. Okay. So there's a lot of terminology here. Um, so first of all, the first term you need to know um, is what is uh, the local bubble? Um, so this is an artist's conception of the local bubble. And so the local bubble um, is a cavity in space in which the sun currently resides. Uh, the sun here is in yellow, it's in the center. Um, the local bubble is this purple thing. And so we know the local bubble um, as, as being defined by three attributes. So first, um, it's lower density than the stuff around it. Um, it contains gas that's more highly ionized. It also contains gas that's hotter. And so we've known about this local bubble as this cavity in space for about 50 years. So going back to the 1970s, we've, already, we've always known that we've occupied a special region uh, in space. But what we didn't know, and what I'll talk about today, is the relationship between this cavity in which the sun resides and the formation of all of the nearest star forming regions around our sun in the Milky Way galaxy. So you can see all of these sort of uh, like little nebulous gas clouds and all these white points. Those are dense gas clouds that currently reside on the surface of this cavity um, in three spatial dimensions. They all have names uh, based sort of on the constellations in which they reside. So Ophiuchus and Lupus and Chrono So we've also known about these star coming regions for about 100 years. But what we didn't know is the connection between the evolution of this cavity and the formation of all nearby stars. <coughs> and so we call it, uh, one of the other terms that was in the title is supernova driven star formation. And so basically the sequence of events I'm gonna talk about today um, occurred uh, when supernovas started going off, created this uh, shock wave that expanded outward and swept up all the interstellar gas and dust around the sun, uh, created this dense shell that fragmented and collapsed and formed all of these star regions. So that's what I'm talking about today. Um, so as someone who studies the interstellar medium and as someone who studies star formation, one of the huge challenges in understanding how stars form in galaxies like the Milky Way is that it involves a huge range of scales, like eight orders of magnitude and scale, um, in the sense that things that happen on much larger scales in galaxies can trickle down and affect <coughs> the processes that happen on very small scales. And so one example of that is that the chain of events I'm gonna talk about today have actually affected uh, the formation of things like protoplanetary disks and young star forming regions on scales that are orders of magnitude smaller than the, the scales I'm talking about. So from like one side of the bubble to the other, um, that's about 300 parsecs across. Um, and then if you could actually zoom in then into individual star forming regions on the surface. So for instance, we looked at a factor of 10 times smaller scale in one of these clouds, we would see this beautiful um, Rho-Ophiuchus nebula where you, see, you can see these bright young stars are forming on the surface there. And then if you zoomed in another star forming region and you zoomed in by a factor of 10,000, you would see this protoplanetary disk, which is from Alma. So it's a baby planetary system that's forming around a, a very young star. Um, and so what I'm going to argue today is that the sequence of events is happening 
are actually trickling down and producing a lot of the most famous nearby protoplanet disks and exoplanets and young star formations. Just give you a sense. Is it, is it the currently, like, is it surprising that we're at the center of this bubble, or are we in the center? That's a great question. So everyone, it's making deeply, deeply uncomfortable that we're at the center of this bubble. And, roll over this and I will talk about that extensively at the end and why you should feel slightly less uncomfortable. Okay, yes, yeah. that's always, whenever we're at the center of anything, that's really bad, but we have an explanation. Uh, and it wasn't always at the center, actually. Um, okay. So, hey, Catherine, before you go on, um, yeah. Were those just a sample of a few star forming regions or was that actually all there was? Somehow I thought that was like they were more distributed along the surface. Yeah, so I'll talk about, uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. So I'll show you sort of a, a, a larger scale picture. So there's other star forming regions that are on other bubbles beyond the local bubble. Um, there's lots of other gas that's on the surface, um, but it's lower density. And so the, the regions that I'm talking about, there are maybe like eight or 10 regions. Um, and so that's most of what there is. Um, the region that there's, there's a reason why they're actually sort of uh, not distributed evenly on the surface. And I'll talk about that later too. Um, okay, thanks. They, they have that geometry, yeah. Okay, so just to orient you in the galaxy, um, a lot of this work is based on actually understanding the distribution of young stars and interstellar gas in 3D. Um, which has really not been a given. Um, it's only been recently been possible in the last two years or so. And so what I'm showing you right here, this is an artist's conception of the Milky Way galaxy, but we think the galaxy looks like from outside. Um, it, we, we know now that this cartoon is actually deeply flawed. Um, it gives you a sense of scale here. And so this is the Milky Way galaxy, and we're going to zoom in around the sun. So the sun is this yellow dot here. We can get, this is the local bubble. Um, so it's a tiny fraction of the whole galaxy. And then these green little skeleton things you'll see throughout the top, those are the star forming regions um, on the surface of the bubble. Um, and the reason why we didn't understand this relationship between star formation and this giant cavity until now is that it's not visible in 2D from our perspective in the sun. So I'll show you what that means. Um, so this is exactly we're in a spaceship looking out uh, from the outside of the galaxy. But because we're inside the bubble, um, there's absolutely no way to tell sort of the 3D geometry of gas and dust without very advanced statistical techniques. Uh, so this is sort of looking out on the star forming regions and on the uh, on the sky from inside uh, the bubble from a perspective here on Earth. So that's the Earth right here. These little green things are the, are the star forming regions. And so there's no basically way to tell the correlation between these regions and large, like larger scale structure in the galaxy without these accurate 3D models of, of gas and dust in the Milky Way. Okay, so the end of the story first, um, and so I'll walk through this in more detail, is that basically within the last two years, we can actually reconstruct a high resolution 3D model in both space and time of this nearby gaseous material, this dense gas that forms new stars. And we can also actually uh, chart out the, the 3D distribution of these young stars themselves. So we can build a 3D physical picture of how stars form in the Milky Way. And when we do this, we find that this local bubble is cavity in interstellar space, is responsible for all nearby star formation around the sun to within about four or five hundred parsecs in the Milky Way galaxy. So I want to emphasize that um, sort of this, this first punchline that we now have this 3D physical picture of dense gas and young stars um, is really transformational to studies of uh, an interstellar medium um, and hasn't been possible uh, except in the last like year or two really, so it's, it's really a, a field that's been transformed extremely quickly. And so I want to give you a sense of what we had before these 3D views. Um, so specifically, um, prior to around 2018, 2020, uh, with the rise of a mission called the Gaia Space Telescope, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, we only had what we call position position models of nearby star forming regions, where we're essentially missing any depth information like this 3D cloud has been sort of collapsed uh, and integrated into like a single plane. Uh, and so we call those position position maps of molecular clouds. And so this is a star forming region. This, this is a molecular map. This is like CO or something. This is, a, this is an integrated dust map. Oh, it's um, dust. Okay. It's dust from, uh, from Herschel and Planck. So it's a 2D dust map. Okay. So this has sort of been our view of star forming regions for about 100 years. Um, so it's all integrated. So it's just a plane of the sky, what we call a plane of the sky view. We have no physical picture. We either have these 2D views, or we have these uh, so-called false 3D views. They're called position, position, velocity space views of the ISM. So that's that same cloud. Um, it's called the Perseus molecular cloud. Um, and it looks like it's 3D, 
um, but actually it's called position position velocity space, where the third dimension is not actual distance or physical depth of the cloud, but rather it's the radial velocity of the cloud obtained from uh, the Doppler effects of a, of a carbon monoxide CO uh, spectral line. And so neither of these views are actual three-dimensional views of the ISM or how the 3D, the IS, sorry, does everyone know what the ISM is, interstellar medium, the gas that forms new stars? Okay, uh, so I'll say ISM throughout the talk. Um, so neither of these views are actual true 3D views of the ISM, and that's what we're going to be building today. <clears throat> and so the goal is to construct a 3D physical picture of dense gas and young stars. And so that requires uh, a number of dimensions. So first, um, we need so-called position, position, position space, which is just 3D physical space, so X, Y, Z. And then we need three dimensions of velocity, so how that, that gas in young stars is moving in three dimensions, so Vx, Vy, Vz. And then we need time as well. So essentially what we want for these nearby star moving regions is everything that we can get in numerical simulations. And so there's three main ingredients that we need to understand star formation near the sun. So first, as I said, we need to know the 3D spatial distribution of dense star forming molecular gas in the sun. Then we need to know the 3D space motion of this dense gas, and we'll use it, uh, we'll, we'll trace it using the motion of its young embedded stars that are forming in these gas clouds. And then we just actually need a model for the surface of this bubble in three dimensions. So I'm going to walk through these three ingredients. Um, so the first ingredient we need in order to understand star formation near the sun is we need to know the 3D spatial distribution of dense star forming and molecular gas. So how do we actually obtain these 3D views of the interstellar gas in the sun? So we're going to use a technique called 3D dust mapping. And 3D dust mapping uses the effect that dust has on stellar colors, so stars grow up in the Milky Way, in order to map its 3D distribution. And so the idea here is that the interstellar medium, the stuff that's forming these young stars, uh, they contain two components, so gas, which is most of the, the mass of the, ice, of the interstellar medium, and then dust. Um, which are sort of like smoke particles that both redden and extinguish light. Um, so even though they, they take up like 1% of the mass, they extinguish uh, like 30% of the light. Um, so they have a huge effect here. Um, so we can actually use uh, the effect of these little dust particles in these gas clouds on the colors of stars that are scattered throughout them to render true 3D models of the interstellar gas near the sun. So how does this work? Um, so say that we have observed a star in the Milky Way um, and we could observe it um, using photometry, so sampling the light of the star in sort of large wavelength bins. So if there was no dust between us and the star, um, this green star would appear intrinsically green as we detected uh, in our images. And so we have a number of uh, like these gigantic photometric surveys that just like uh, sample the colors of stars all across the Milky Way. And so, say for instance that there is now um, an interstellar gas cloud, like the kind that's forming these stars in the Milky Way between us and the star. That no longer holds true, um, and the intrinsically green light of that star will become reddened in our detectors. And so you can see this effect very clearly. Um, this is a, a dense globule uh, in the Milky Way. And so you'll see sort of on the outskirts of that cloud that the stars tend to be more reddened um, than unassociated background stars. Um, so that happens all across the galaxy. And so of course this effect is very complicated because stars have different intrinsic uh, colors. But basically you can imagine that if we had many stars scattered throughout this uh, star forming cloud in 3D, uh, their light will be reddened by different amounts depending on where they are with respect to this cloud along uh, sort of we're reviewing in the galaxy. And so you can imagine that if we had like very fancy data science techniques that I don't have time to go into today, you could simultaneously infer where all these stars are in the galaxy, uh, how much dust is between us, the, us and the star, uh, and the intrinsic types of all these stars. So what their intrinsic colors are, that produce this consistent distribution of stellar colors um, that we observe in this parallelogram. And so that's 3D dust mapping in a nutshell. And so we've been able to do this for about 10 or 15 years. Um, but there's this new mission called Gaia that gave us the precise distance to all of these stars in the Milky Way, like a billion stars in the galaxy, um, which has allowed us to do 3 dust mapping a lot better and render these new views of the interstellar medium. So that's an example of a 3D dust map uh, in the Milky Way. You can see uh, it's actually centered on the sun. So these brown smudges, um, that's showing you the large scale distribution of uh, interstellar gas. Here, this on a very large scale. 
What, what's with the wedge on the bottom? That is because Pan Stars is not a star. Oh, that's Pan Stars. Yeah, so okay. It doesn't yeah. observe the sun. Yeah, that's yeah. not. The okay. galaxy is not missing a chunk out of it. <laughs> Good. Uh, it's, this, this doesn't. Yeah, it's just um, we didn't have any data there, so yeah. we didn't. We didn't yeah. get a yeah. Why does it look like it's only in point? Is that also? Great question. So it's only in a plane uh, because, uh, so like the Milky Way, it's like shaped sort of like a pancake with a bulge in the center. And so almost all of the dust is in like. Oh, so you're observing really far. Oh. Yeah, you're observing oh. really far. Yeah, so this is on much larger. So we'll zoom in. I don't know if I have a pointer actually. There's a physical pointer if you expand it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it does that too. Okay. <laughs> That's a less useful feature. Oh, okay. <laughs> So like what I'm going to talk about today, what I showed before, is like this region, and then this is like on very large scales, and we'll zoom down into the region I'm talking about. This is like uh, I think four kiloparsecs across, if that means anything to you. Um, so it's like on the scale of spiral structure in the galaxy. Okay, um, and so 3D dust mapping has undergone somewhat of a renaissance in the last few years, um, and so we're able to resolve like the large scale structure of galaxies out to many kiloparsecs down to resolving individual star moon regions in these galaxies. Um, so on the left-hand side, this is a top-down first eye view of the distribution of gas near the sun. So the sun's in the center, and like more white colored mean that there's, there's dust in these regions. And so you'll see that there's like these large scale features that I actually don't have time to talk about today. These are like uh, parts of the spiral structure of the galaxy. This is called the Radcliffe wave. It's actually a, like a, a uh, a sine wave of gas that actually defines one of the local uh, nearby arms of the galaxy. Um, but what we're actually going to do is, thanks to very advanced statistical pipelines, we're actually going to use 3D dust mapping uh, to zoom down into individual star forming regions. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, this is a cutout from a new 3D dust map from Leica, Glassler, and Enzo in 2020, which uses something called information field theory to map out the distribution of star forming gas at one parsec resolution which is like unprecedented resolution for people who study star formation. This is actually on the right hand, oops, question, no, okay. On the right hand side, this is an actual uh, 3D cutout of a uh, star forming <coughs> molecular cloud on the right hand side. And like this just didn't exist three years ago. This is totally new. Um, Alyssa will tell you how exciting it is to have these views of the ISM. I never thought I'd see that in my life. Yeah, she never thought she'd see that in her lifetime. <laughs> and so what we've done. Question. Oh, yeah. So to be clear, how you make these view maps is know the distance to the obscuring body. And so from the intensity of the light through that obscuring, uh, that obscuring body and the distance to each star. We know that we know the we know the distance of the stars whose light is being obscured, and so if you say like you have like some cloud a lot like some like say that like you're a dust cloud right and then you're a star like <clears throat> if we have some stars like right here some stars right there like the colors of the of the stars behind the cloud will be much red more red than the colors of the stars in front because the light from the dust cloud will be red in those colors. So if we know the distances to each star, we can basically figure out where the obscuring material is um, in all regions of the galaxy. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. Um, and so what you see here. I guess is that complicated if the stars have slightly different uh, different ages or something like that? Then they just retro different. Yeah, it's, make it's sure super. They're... Yeah, so it's, this is all super complicated and take, it takes like millions of CPU hours to do. Mm -hmm. and so the problem is that there's lots of degeneracies between like the types of stars, like whether you're like a very massive star or a very like low mass star. Um, depends on whether you're an evolved star or you're on like an evolved star. Uh, so there's degeneracies there. So there's a lot of uh, trade offs. Um, so individually, you might not get every single star right, but like cumulatively, if you have a billion stars, it's fine if like I get you wrong, but you're right, and then most of you right. So, yeah. How how would you see like a concave feature in a cloud like that? If it's just like transmission line of sight, or, or can you not? It just it looks like these three D models are, are not like fully convex. Uh, don't think I understand. I think she understands your question. <laughs> there are many, many stars, and okay. so you have. Imagine that you had stars peppered throughout this whole thing. Not so just it's behind. Not just behind. Okay. Oh yeah, it's many. It's like many. Like each patch gets like its own distribution of like dust along that patch, and then if you do it like patch by patch across the whole sky, you can render these 3D models. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so you see here, these are just essentially, oh, every, this is essentially, uh, it should like move around. Hold on. It should have, it should be rotating. Yeah, there they are. Okay. So these are all um, the nearby, these are the dozen nearest dark moon regions near the sun in 3D. Um, you can see they all have very sort of filamentary like shapes, some of shapes like sheets, um, and that's actually think related to how they're forming. Um, and so I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but basically the punchline here is we actually know exactly where these things are, you know, their properties, uh, and we know, um, we know where they are, we know their properties, and we know their exact like substructure, which is um, the critical component here. Catherine, to be yeah. sure I'm understanding the, the sort of yes. image, the like the yellow and purple colors yeah. are the stars and the uh, sort of turquoise is the dust. Yeah, so this is so this was like um, the these little these little like little spiny things here. Those were uh, for those are those are just sort of like a topological representation of the dust. So like the cyan colors, that's all the dust, that's the actual dust distribution. And this is just tra tracing out like what we call the skeleton of the structure, which was used for basically an ancillary analysis. We don't really have time to talk about. Um, but I'll actually show you the stars inside the dust clouds a little bit later. But these are just sort of demarcations of where these dust clouds lie um, in 3D. Um, yeah. And the second question is, uh... Help, help maybe a previous question or um, yeah. give us an idea how many stars there were used to abstract this dust map. Yeah, so for this dust map, um, these are cutouts from Lenka 2020. They used 5 million stars. Um, the large scale dust map I showed previously, um, we used uh, a billion stars. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, my, my comment slash question was related to that second yeah. question, but also related to your question. Um, so one of the things that we're here doing in New York is working on a huge database slash visualization quest with Micah and his colleagues at the American Museum of Natural History. And so we could actually make one of these that shows all the stars in the box as well. And I think that would be really yeah. informative to give you a sense of just how densely sampled this is. So yeah, yeah. We should, that's easy. We should do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. But the reason I asked the question specifically was that I thought maybe the other questioner didn't appreciate the density of information that yeah. makes it all redundant. Yeah. There were just 20 stars or something, you wouldn't get very far. Yeah, we're working on adding even more stars, actually. We need even better distances to these stars. And so, uh, yeah, the more stars we include up to some point, the, the higher resolution you can get. Um, and so in particular, we're working on uh, adding very like deep infrared data. Um, so in order to do 3D dust mapping, we have to see stars through these clouds. If you don't actually see the reddening effect, from stars behind the cloud, you can't actually tell any dust is there. And so working on incorporating even deeper photometric data to make more, more uh, high resolution maps of these regions. All right, so let me, let me skip this for now. Um, so we have our first ingredient, which is the 3D spatial distribution of all the gas in the sun. And the second ingredient we need is we actually have to know the motion of all of these um, gas clouds as well. And we're going to use that by using the motions of the young stars or that is young stars that are embedded in these gas clouds. Okay, so this is a 3D cutout of one of these clouds. It's the same cloud I showed you before. Um, this is in gray. This is the 3D interstellar gas distribution uh, in XYZ. And then you see that there's like a little cluster of points here in yellow. That's actually um, a young cluster that's about a million years old that's forming in this gas cloud. Um, and so because it formed in this gas cloud, it inherits the motion of the thing in which it formed. Um, and thanks to Guy, it not only measured the precise positions of these stars, but also their motions in, in 3D. Um, so this vector is showing you exactly how this, this cloud is moving in three spatial dimensions. And so we can actually use all of the embedded stars that are forming in all these clouds as a tracer of the motion of the clouds over time. And we can do this because they've not strayed too far from their birth site because they're very young. Um, and uh, you can actually measure the velocities of the star, the radial velocities of the stars and also of the, of the gas, and they agree, uh, which is really good. And then the last ingredient um, is we need a model for the surface of the bubble. Um, so you actually have to know where the bubble, this cavity in three dimensions lies. Um, so there's various ways uh, that we can measure this. So I said that the bubble is, um, there's less stuff uh, in the bubble than, than around it. It's hotter and it's also more highly ionized. Um, and so uh, basically this model for the local bubble comes from Pilgrims at all 2020. Um, and it's basically tracing the, the walls of the, of the local bubble um, 
as a transition between sort of an empty region of space um, and sort of some material on the cap uh, on the edge of the wall. So it's actually tracing the transition region between very low density material and higher density material. And so this is again, these are different projections of uh, a dust map in 3D. And then in black, this is tracing the walls um, of the cavity in three spatial dimensions. Um, and so they've gone through and they've actually calculated, um, essentially looking out from the sun, where is the first point in space where you need any sort of uh, wall of material. And so that's how they've created this purple surface of the bubble in three spatial dimensions. Um, but they've looked at other tracers as well and they find that they all agree. Um, so we sort of know the, the wall of the cavity really well uh, in three dimensions. What are the little green wiggles further out? Yeah, so this was, they were actually trying to trace the, both the inner and, so there's like, you can imagine the cavity, it has, like there's empty region of space and there's like an inner surface of the, of the like where you actually start seeing some stuff and then there's like an outer surface where the shell has some thickness. And so they can actually trace the inner surface of the bubble really well in red. And then their, their resolution is getting a lot worse, so they can't actually trace the outer surface. But that's what the green is supposed to be. Um, it's them tracing the outer surface of the bubble, but it's, it's much more poorly constrained by the, by the data. Okay, so we have our three main ingredients. Um, and so I just want to show you this in three dimensions really quick uh, in an interactive figure. Let me click here. So I'm going to turn some stuff off. Okay, so this is right here. Um, this is a, the, a cutout of the region right around the sun in our solar neighborhood. So the sun's right here. This is us looking down from the, on the Milky Way from above. Um, this is going at about 400 parsecs, so it's a tiny chunk of the galaxy. And in gray, that's the distribution of all the interstellar gas around the sun from the 3D dust maps. And then it's a slice in the galactic plane. This is this is a top this is a top down view. Okay, it's a projection. It's a projection. Okay. Yeah. So this all is right. this is looking in the plane of ah, galaxy, okay. and then all this right. is well. looking top down. So you can like move it all around. So that's <laughs> this is the benefit cool. of three D. Um, so this is top down looking from above, and then these are all of the the little skeletons I showed you before that you asked a question about. Um, these are where all the star forming regions are. So it's just demarcating the gas that's actually forming stars. There's, there's a lot of low density gas that doesn't form stars. And then um, this is the model for the local bubble. And so one thing that you'll notice is that all of these skeletons that represent star forming regions, they're all uh, hugging the surface of the local bubble if you look at them in three spatial dimensions. Like this one over here, over here. So they're all sort of draped along the surface of this bubble. And so not only that, but I mentioned how we can trace the motion of these of these clouds by looking at the motion of their embedded young stars. And so what I'm going to show right now is the actual young star clusters that are forming um, in this uh, shell of the bubble. Let me turn off some stuff. And so what you'll notice is like these are all young stars that are forming on the surface of these clouds here and here and here. And the, the apex of the cone is pointing in the direction of motion. And so what, what we found is that not only do these all lie on the surface of the bubble, but their embedded young stars point outward from the surface as if they're being swept up on the surface over time. And so the clear implication of the combined morphology and positions of these clouds and also the motions of their young stars is that these are sort of are riding outwards away from the center of the, of the bubble and they've been swept up by uh, the expansion of the bubble over time. What would be a typical uh, velocity, peculiar velocity, let's call it, uh, of that motion? Yeah, so, um, so right now, so we actually trace back the motions and we actually trace back the evolution of the, the shell over time. So right now they're actually moving pretty slowly about seven kilometers per second. So this is sort of a very old uh, supernova remnant, um, but I'll show you a little bit sort of how that evolved in the past. I had another question, which was there were some orange ones that looked like they weren't on the surface, um, uh, sort of to the lower left of the picture. Uh, yes. So yeah, so that so the yeah so these ones yeah yeah so those actually lie on a on a different bubble. So there's the problem is I'm only showing one bubble at the moment. 
But this is part of a very famous region called the Orion Arrhythmus Superbubble. And so there's a bubble over here. There's a bubble over here. There's one right here, actually. So oh, could you use, I'm sorry, could you use your pointer? Oh, sorry. Laptop? Sorry, yeah. So there, this, this region is part of a region. This is part of a large superbubble called the Orion Arrhythmus Superbubble. So this is actually on a different superbubble over here. It's just not shown in this model. Hey, I think somebody has to mute. Funny sound coming off the speakers. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So the problem with this diagram is we don't. Sh so this is like our like continual quest is to sh like chart out all of these bubbles. But there's there's actually these orange parts on a different bubble that's not shown. Um, there's a bubble <laughs> over to the right hand side. There's actually one down south here and one up to the left. So we actually think that the entire Milky Way is just sort of this bubbly medium. Um, and so that we'll talk about that later, but if there's bubbles everywhere, uh, and this is a particularly large bubble, it's like statistically not crazy to be close to the center of such a large volume bubble. But if we like, if we like move slightly to the left or slightly to the right, because there's bubbles everywhere, we'd just be inside a different bubble. Um, and so these are all bubbles that are just not shown, uh, but we're working on charting them out uh, in 3D. Yeah, so the clear implication is that um, these are all, uh, on the surface and all, all facing away from the surface. And so they're sort of uh, dynamically linked to the evolution of this cavity. Okay, so what do we actually think happens? Um, let me show you the progression in time. Um, so basically the cool thing about having all these young stars on the surface is that we can actually trace back their motion in the galactic potential and figure out where they were in the past. And because we know the ages of the clusters, we can actually figure out when they were born. And so we can actually reconstruct the history of star formation over the last 20 billion years or so using the motions and ages and, and properties of these embedded young stars. And so what we find is that about 14 million years ago, um, the set of supernova um, explosions started occurring near the center of the local bubble today. Um, and those supernova went off and they triggered this um, expanding shock wave and eventually uh, that shock wave will radiatively cool and then an expanding dense shell will form um, uh, just behind the shock as it expands outward. And then what will happen is the supernova remnant will enter something called the snowplow phase, where it will start sweeping up uh, ambient interstellar material on its surface. You can see here, and then eventually parts of that surface will become so dense that they'll fragment and collapse and uh, form the next generation of stars. And so that's what we think we're happening, that's what we think is happening in the solar neighborhood. <coughs> This is, we think that's what's happening for the formation of the local bubble. Yeah. So the shock wave isn't necessarily pushing away stars, but it's causing dust to clump more and create more stars. Yeah. So it's like you can like it's called the snowplow phase. It really is like a snowplow, and you're like basically evacuating the inside of this cavity, and then you have like this like this dense shell that's like expanding outwards, and then eventually uh, it'll just there'll be parts of that shell that will condense and fragment. Um, so it's not moving any existing stars, it's like moving the gas outwards, and then that gas is probably like it's creating conditional conditions that are favorable for star formation. Yeah. And then presumably the stars that are formed there have that outward velocity. Exactly. That's why they have the outward velocity that we see. <clears throat> yeah. And so that was the cartoon, but we actually have the real data. And so unfortunately we can't trace both the gas and the stars because the gas is very nebulous and we actually, it's really hard to sort of trace this entire gas cloud, this nebulous sort of cloudy region back in time. But we can trace the motion of its young stars back. So that's what you're seeing on the right hand side. So it's the left hand side is the cartoon and the right hand side is the real data. So I'll play one more time. That's the cartoon and the real data. Um, and I'll explain the, and the real data in a second. We must be modeling the gravitational force. I mean, the stars are just moving under gravity at yeah. this point. Yeah, so basically the problem is that, so we're modeling, uh, so we're modeling the, like we're modeling the, like the large scale gravitational potential in the galaxy. We're actually not modeling any gravitational effects from like the gas clouds or interactions between the stars. So it's very simplistic. You can actually only do these sorts of backward trajectories for these young stars, like 10 or 20 million years, and then the air sort of uh, explode. Um, so there's only a limited regime in which we can actually do this and it's valid. I don't know if I answered your question though. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. For the supernova remnant to be that big, I mean, the, doesn't the, the pre existing density have to be very small to begin with? So, yeah. like, wasn't there already cavity there, or is this just like multiple supernova going off? And... Yeah, so it depends. So, there's obviously there's a trade off between 
So if you have a lower ambient density, you can, uh, you can make a, a same set cavity with fewer supernova right. versus if you have a higher density and you have more supernova. Um, and so we estimate there's about one supernova that went off per year. And that's based on a variety of things. It's based on looking at, um, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, we actually know the cluster that hosted the stars that went supernova. We can actually figure out which stars are missing and which ones went off and sort of when in the path it would have exploded. Uh, we can also look at the current momentum in the shell and figure out how many supernova we needed to actually create the momentum that we see today. Um, and they all agree, which is really good. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. How far yeah. away were we from, how far away was the Earth? Oh, that's a great question. I'll talk about that too. I have actually have a diagram showing, yeah. it, showing that. Like, are there any like terrestrial, like, I mean, I don't know if you could see any signals. Oh, this is, I have, it's like, I have, it's, it's, it's in like 10 slides. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Will you talk about the remnants too? Uh, I'll talk about the remnants too. Yeah. I'll talk about all this stuff. Yeah. All right. Do you have a question? No. I just okay. emanated. God. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, one thing that's really cool is that if we assume that all of these star forming regions have been formed in this, like, the swept up expansion of the shell, um, we can actually model the parameters of the super bubble's evolution as a function of time, because we know when and where these clusters were born on the surface. Um, and so, we actually uh, do uh, model the evolution of this bubble, assuming that supernova are the only thing that's powering it, which is sort of an approximation. Um, we can actually fit for things like uh, when the first supernova went off that formed this bubble, uh, what was the, I, the density of the interstellar medium when it first exploded, um, and how frequently the supernova went off. But that all seems very strange because you said that the, the, the disk is filled with bubbles, yeah. and you're sort of implying there was a past in which it wasn't. Yes, uh, I agree. Um, I feel like so ultimately, you'd want to model the interaction of all of these bubbles and like get a complete sense of where. Presumably, there were bubbles before us. Yeah. So ideally, you would model it in like some clumpy medium where there's all these perturbations, the density. Yeah. But we have like this is like the first time like it's yes. never like it's, it's very this challenging. This is like the zeroth order. This is the zero. This is the absolute zeroth yeah. order, yeah. and then we have to do much better. In but it's fair to think of you know like a pot of boiling water, right? You have all these bubbles all the time, and they're just not the same bubbles. Yeah. And it actually really messes with you. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Is that um, we have one cloud that's like wedged between two bubbles, and the only reason we figured this out is because the stars are moving in the wrong direction. Because there was like it's wedged between two bubbles, and like one bubble is younger, and so it's moving it this way. But then it looks like this other. Anyway, I'll talk about it a little bit. But like yeah. you really have to model the ensemble. Uh, anyways, this is what the the bubble's evolution looks like. This is uh, the the velocity of the shell um, over time. So from the bubble's formation to the present day. So it's about, it's moving at about seven kilometers per second. Uh, it's about 165 parsecs uh, wide in the present day. And then um, the momentum injection for supernova is a, uh, a few times 10 to the five slow mass kilometers per second. What did you say the rate of supernova you assume was? Uh, one, it's, it's about one per year. Yeah, one per mega year. One per mega year. Oh, one per mega year. Did I say one per year? One per mega year. One per year. Why did you say? <laughs> this would be like, it would be like, wow, it would okay. be like the best starburst in like the history of, okay, one per mega year. That's a more wow. comforting number. Yeah, one per mega year. Sorry. This is why I get for talking too fast. <laughs> okay. So this is the progression. So we think about 17, so 17 million years ago, we're assuming that nothing is really happening. That's a zero order approximation. Um, and then what's really interesting is that about 15 or 16 million years ago, um, these two clusters formed very close together in 3D space. Um, these have names, which we'll ignore for the moment. Um, but what's, uh, what's good to keep in mind is that we think that these two clusters hosted enough supernova to power the expansion of the bubble. Um, so they, they about 15 have gone off, according to various models, for these clusters in the past uh, 15 million years ago. Um, and they were exactly at the center of the bubble when it first started forming. And so these two clusters are the culprits for the supernova that went off and powered its expansion. And so we argue about 14 million years ago, the supernova start going off, and then it'll expand over time. And then what you'll see happening is that as we move forward in time, so now we're at 10 mega years, you'll see these little dots appear on the surface. Um, and that's when my model predicts that um, a cluster formed at that time period, and the gas has been converted into stars. So we'll keep moving forward, and we'll keep seeing things appear on the surface. So 
clusters are forming here. So each red dot or cyan dot or any colored dot is just a cluster that formed at that time period. And those are constrained by the, the cluster ages? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's constrained by the cluster ages. And see, Catherine, what are those little yellow dots on the left? Oh, that's the sun. We'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, we're right at, oh yeah, we're right at time. So we're gonna, we'll talk about that. <laughs> and so we'll keep going, moving forward. Things will keep forming. Uh, and then we'll get to the present day where we have this dense gas and ring stars all over the living <laughs> bubble. So ideally, like, so like we're, we're doing a very simple approximation. We have like a spherical expansion model. We have like 20 clusters, mm -hmm. um, but this is just like a framework to do more uh, advanced statistical modeling when we know now more information from the kinematics of these clusters from, from new data releases like guys. Uh, but it does feel like there's a little bit of a, like this, this model is sort of mixing up different physics in a certain way because the stars form when the bubble is expanding fast, like the stars that are older yep. formed, and so they should now be, they should now have expanded more than the bubble um, <clears throat> because they formed in a time when the bubble was expanding more rapidly and now it's expanding slowly. So it feels like there should be some separation of the stars and the dense gas. Well, the young stars are really, really young. Yeah. Well, but some formed earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they thought 10 million, 10 million years. But yeah, most most of the constraining power is coming from the last five mega years or, got, mega years or so, uh, I would say. So most of them are pretty young. Um, but I agree, there's a lot of second order effects that we're not, mm -hmm. just not considering. Yeah, there's like a... Yeah. Okay, so as I said, we actually think we know the progenitor population um, for this bubble. Um, so they actually lie, these two clusters lie on the, on the edge of the bubble in the present day, but if you trace them back to when the bubble first started forming, they were near the center. Um, so if you look at their present day membership, um, uh, various studies have predicted that they form between 14 and 20 supernova since they've been uh, alive. Um, and then what we actually did is we actually calculated how much momentum is on the surface of this is in the surface of this shell. So essentially what's the mass that's been swept up over time and what's its velocity. And we've tried to compute how much momentum needs to be injected by supernova to account for the, the characteristics of the bubble that we see today. And we find that about 15 supernova were needed to power the expansion. Um, so that's good because these two numbers are great. Sorry, what, what's the acronym LCC and UCL? Uh, that's just the name of the clusters. It stands for Upper Centaurus Lupus and Lower Centaurus Crux, which is why I did not say them before. Uh, <laughs> that's just the name of the clusters, yeah. Those are the two clusters that form the local bubble. Yeah. So was it, was it 15 supernova 15 million years ago? No, or, so the, or... the first supernova went off about 14, 15 okay. million years ago, and then they've been go on, going off at a rate of about one per mega year. Okay. One per mega year um, <laughs> until uh, about a million or two years ago. Yeah. And so this is just the range. So there's some uncertainty in how much mass has been swept up uh, and, and the velocity of the shell in the present day. And so we think it's about an average of 15, but there's a huge spread in the number of supernova needs to power the bubble's expansion. Okay, so getting back to the question so the, uh, how did the sun wind up in the bubble? Um, so basically by accident, and so one thing that we can do that's really cool is we have a model for the expansion of the bubble, so how it evolved over time based on the formation of these young clusters on its surface. We actually also know the backward trajectory of the sun, so we can figure out where the sun was when the bubble first started forming, and the sun was actually 300 parsecs away, there was like nowhere in the site, and it actually crossed over into the bubble's uh, shell about five or six million years ago. So it's just a cartoon of that. So it was very far away, about 300 parsecs away. And then five or six million years ago, it crossed into the shell. And it now sits near the, oops, it now sits near the center. It's okay. There you go. Yeah, so it's only been close to the center for the past three mega years or so. Um, and so of course the question is, like what does the sun, sun's time crossing the bubble actually mean for Earth? Does it have any effect here on Earth? Um, and we actually think it does have an effect here on Earth. So what is that effect? Um, so we think it actually, the sun crossing into the bubble, we actually think affected um, the properties of the heliosphere around the sun. So essentially, right around the, the solar system, um, there's something called the heliosphere, which is created by the solar wind, sort of like a magne magnetosphere, and it's a protective cocoon. So you can see the sun's here, and then the Earth is actually inside the heliosphere um, in the present day. Um, but one thing that's really fascinating is that actually crossing through a dense cloud like the bubble's shell um, five or six million years ago 
can actually shrink the heliosphere and expose the, the Earth and many other planets to the ambient interstellar medium and ambient sort of cosmic rays. Um, so this is showing you what happens when um, you can actually shrink the heliosphere. So uh, I don't know if you guys know about Voyager 1 or Voyager 2, uh, but Voyager 1 actually has left the, the, the protective cocoon of the heliosphere. Uh, and the heliosphere actually protects the, the Earth from about 75% of cosmic rays. This is showing you year versus like cosmic ray influx. Um, and so you'll notice that in 2012, you see how that, that blue curve goes way up. Um, that is when Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, like the, the protective cocoon around the Earth, um, and actually exposed us to a lot of cosmic rays. Um, and so what we think happens is that when you pass through a dense cloud, like the bubble surface, you can shrink the heliosphere, you can expose the Earth to cosmic rays, you can also expose it to the ambient interstellar medium. Um, and so we have a collaborator named Morav Ofer that has looked at the effect of crossing a dense cloud that has on um, the properties of the heliosphere around the Earth. Um, and uh, she found that if you have the sun crossing a dense cloud, so basically like the differential, the, the ram pressure can shrink it. So depending on the, the density of the cloud you're passing through and how fast you're passing through that cloud, you can shrink it. And about five or six million years ago, you actually shrunk the heliosphere to about 0.7 AU. And you actually expose all planets except for Mercury and Venus to the ambient interstellar medium. Um, and so we think that about seven, six, six or seven million years ago, um, the heliosphere shrunk and exposed the Earth um, to ISM due to uh, the bubbles cross, uh, the sun crossing the bubble shell. Yeah. So this is a dumb question. Has anyone looked back at the fossil record or anything back at that time? Not, not a dumb question. Not a dumb question. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, so what people have done is um, they've actually looked at um, a record, uh, a, a, a record called Iron 60. Um, which is a radioactive isotope. Um, and they've looked at it over the past uh, 10 million years or so. And basically what happens is that when the heliosphere shrinks and you expose the Earth to the ambient interstellar medium, uh, dust grains from interstellar space can actually be deposited here on Earth in like deep sea sediments. They can be deposited in, in um, like the lunar soil as well. Um, and essentially there is an iron isotope that's produced in supernova explosions called iron 60. And it has a known half-life of about 2.6 mega years. And as I said, it's produced in uh, supernova explosions. And we see it uh, in a number of samples in deep ocean, in the Arctica, and uh, on the surface of the moon. Um, and you'll see here, this one is showing you on the right-hand side, is age in the past as a function of influx of this iron 60. <coughs> and so you'll notice that there are like these two peaks here, um, one about two or three mega, mega years ago, and one about like five to seven mega years ago. And many people argue that the only way to get these influx in iron 60 is to shrink the heliosphere um, because these iron 60 grains are incorporated, these iron 60 particles are incorporated into dust grains. When you expose yourself to the ISM, you can actually deposit them here on Earth. And so we think it's possible that this, um, this later peak here at six mega years um, occurred because the sun crossed the local bubble. And because there was all this enrichment in iron 60 from these recent supernova that formed the local bubble, it actually produced the observed uh, iron isotope signature over the past 10 million years or so. Um, so that's an effect that it had uh, here on Earth. And people also study like climate changes, like if you're outside the heliosphere for part of the year, what is it a, how does it affect the climate? Um, there's like whole literature on that. Um, what is, what's happens earlier? Like, what's what's that other peak? That's a great question. So I actually have that as like an extra slide. Okay. Um, so yeah, so there. I'll let you continue that. Yeah, so that, so yeah, so I can only, so with this, the, for this talk, I can only explain this later peak, but there's another paper that's actually uh, led by Marav and also Avi Loeb and my supervisor at Space Telescope, Josh Peak. But there's like this very peculiar, so like the, the, the stuff is inside the local bubble, it's mostly empty, there's no star formation, but there are like these very fast moving sort of the lower density clouds that are, we, might th we think they might be left over from like the most recent supernova explosions. If they're traveling really fast, you can still shrink the heliosphere. And so we think we actually intersected another sort of lower density cloud inside the bubble um, about two million <laughs> years ago. Um, and so we're, we're working on trying to constrain that, but we think it's a, a different cloud inside the bubble and actually not on the surface of the shell, but like a fluffier thing that's inside the bubble. Yeah. I may have done the calculation wrong, but I was trying to decide how fast the uh, sun has to be moving relative to the local super bubble yeah. to 
the numbers I was getting seemed way faster than it should be, like uh, 3,000 kilometers a second. Is that? Yeah, it's not 3,000 kilometers per second. I think it's more like. I got 20. 20. So, yeah. 20. Yeah, so the sun the sun is moving like the sun is moving like twenty kilometers per second through the ISM, and then it depends at different at different epochs the shell is moving at different speeds. So like early on, like I think five or six million years ago. Twenty kilometers a second is ten to the minus. Oh yeah, that's right. That's what I got actually. I got ten to the okay. minus four times the speed of light. Okay, sorry. Okay. Just it does okay. seem a little fast to me. What's what's uh, in the sense that the does the gas really orbit? 20 kilometers a second different from the sun locally um so i don't study the gas so i don't know yeah so on the so uh so actually so so it depends on which gas clouds you're talking about so mm -hmm. on the surface mm -hmm. of the bubble these are very dense clouds they're moving pretty slowly at like 10 kilometers per second but in, like for shrinking the heliosphere there's a trade-off between density of cloud and velocity of cloud you can have a higher density cloud moving slower and have the same yeah. similar effect as a, a lower density cloud moving faster. And so the stuff that's inside the bubble here is like lower density, but moving faster, we think. Um, but the relevant speed for your kinematic argument is the speed of the sun relative to the center of the bubble. Um, I don't know. Because you, you said that it was 300 parsecs out and it came in in 14 million years. Yeah, but the other part of the calculation is what the speed of the bubble was 6 million years ago. Yes. Yeah. But it's where the speed of the center of the bubble, which is a weird thing. Well, we know something very interesting about that that has to do with the lateral motion of the Radcliffe wave. Oh, I don't that's know like whether a, that's in Catherine's extra, extra it's, slides. It's, it's in the extra, extra, extra slides. We'll show you a secret if you ask nicely. <laughs> okay, yeah, she will. So takeaways. <laughs> Um, so in the present day, almost every single nearby young star lies on the surface of this bubble. And we can explain how star formation near the sun began. And then we have very robust, what I call 6C, so three dimensions of space and three dimensions of velocity. It's just like in simulations, evidence that supernova can sweep up gas into dense clouds and form new stars. It's been a theory for 50 years, and we provide very strong high-resolution evidence that this is the case. And then the sun's lock center in this bubble suggests that these bubbles must be pervasive across the galaxy. And we have a lot of preliminary evidence that this is true. Okay. Um, just to give a brief ode to, to theory, as I said, um, this, this model of <laughs> sort of the bubble, the ISM, has been pervasive for a very long time, um, going back to Cox and Smith, 1974. And so the picture that we're trying to paint is that there are all these bubbles. Um, and that they're intersecting, and at the intersection points you get, this stands for giant molecular clouds, this is like a star coming region. You have like all this snow plow effect happening in the galaxy, creating these new star coming regions at their intersection points. Um, as I said before, the novelty of this work is that we have a very high number of dimensions that you can obtain in simulations. So this is an evidence of supernova driven star formation in a simulation where you have a cluster that's forming in some dense gas, it creates this cavity, uh, and eventually you'll get like these new generations of stars forming on its surface. And so hopefully we can provide some very finite concrete observational data to constrain star formation at high resolution both in simulations and at higher redshift. And so the, the open questions is first, um, how do we go about searching for these other bubbles? So there's various ways that these bubbles can manifest as cavities in interstellar space, but that's not enough. You have to actually hopefully find the progenitors for these cavities um, and figure out sort of how they're forming and evolving over time. We also want to know how these bubbles interact with each other. So I mentioned we started to chart out other bubbles near the sun, and one of them was recently discovered in Bialy et al. 2021, and it's this sort of green shell right here. Um, and so this is the local bubble. This is the Perseus Taurus shell right here. And you'll see that there's actually um, a region at the intersection of these two bubbles. This is the Taurus Darkwing region. And you'll see that the motions of these stars are actually pointing outwards from the local bubble. And so this has to be the more energetic bubble that's actually driving the motion of, of, uh, of these young stars in this cluster. But the idea is to try to understand sort of where all these bubbles are and how they're interacting and how they like regulate star formation on larger scales and galaxies. Uh, so that's an outstanding question. Um, what's the relationship between super bubbles and galactic structure? Um, so at, very early in the talk, there's a question about why the distribution of star forming regions on, the, on this bubble was so um, sort of asymmetric. So you can see that they're preferentially located like on sort of like either side, like there's nothing here and here, but there are star forming regions here and here. 
And so we think that the, the local bubble is interacting with the larger scale spiral structure in the galaxy and actually there's existing gas there that we're actually carving and expanding into and creating like arc like morphologies and larger scale structures. And so we have to understand the relationship between these bubbles on intermediate scales and what's happening in galaxies on very large scales. Um, and then as I alluded to before, um, can observations now constrain to no feedback effect on galaxy evolution, um, both in the way at large and across cosmic time. And so that's, that's all I have. So thank you for your time. Uh, and I have to take any questions. David has a question. Does anybody else have a question before David? <laughs> I'm not sure. David, go ahead. Um, uh, uh, when I was a kid, actually, it's interesting that when I was in grad school, like one of the first classes I ever, like I ever was in, we were yeah. reading about this, and it's interesting how the picture is actually pretty stable. Those early ideas about the bubble turned out to be not that far off, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Yeah. And back then, there's a lot of discussion of this idea that there's like a fountain yeah. where we're blowing out this bubble and yeah. things are falling back down on the disk. What's the status of that? And yes. do you care about that? Yeah, so the status uh, is that, so so what Dave is asking about whether it's like a the local bubble is actually a galactic chimney. So whether the bubble has like a top and a bottom, and if it, if it does not have a top and a bottom, is stuff like being ejected from the galaxy or is gas potentially falling in? Um, and unfortunately, as far as I can tell, the jury is still out on the galactic chimney question. So the data that we have cannot constrain whether the bubble has a top or the bottom. It's so diffuse uh, in those regions that you have to like look at like very like precise stellar absorption line spectroscopy. Right. Um, and so I think it's still uh, actively. And it makes in. sense. It's much more visible here because the gas density is much yeah. denser. At the yeah. Point. And then another related question is when you look at other galaxies yeah. and, you, and you just nearby galaxies, does yeah. it look like that kind of confirms the picture that's growing here? Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. <laughs> I think if you look at enough JWST photos, um, you'll definitely have very high resolution. I think this will like come, come to pass more and more. But you really do see like a lot of very bubbly interstellar medium. And I think as we start to chart these stellar populations, uh, we will see evidence of triggered star formation externally. Um, but of course, we'll never actually get the full 3D motions that we get uh, here in the solar neighborhood. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to understand there's like the effect of positive and negative supernova feedback. So negative supernova feedback is when like this energetic supernova explosions inhibit further star formation. So what I'm arguing is that it's actually enhancing star formation. So understanding the balance of like, does this molecular cloud and this star forming region, does this form due to trigger star formation or not, will be a very interesting question that I'm interested in answering in the JWST era. But I mean, I, th I, think, I think it's consistent, um, but I'm biased. It looks like Glennis has her hand up. Yeah, yes, Glennis. Oh, this is just absolutely so amazingly wonderful. I can't get over it. So my very first question is, are you going to be here tomorrow so I can talk to you? Uh, my train leaves at I think ten thirty. So if you're in, in early, early, um, mm -hmm. it's possible. Maybe we can negotiate something there. Um, yeah. I had a question. Um, what's known about the electron density and magnetic field in the surface of the local bodies? Oh, okay. Intuitively, that it would be. You know, with this my, kind of precision. Okay. So, do you want to describe really quick what these papers? Why I pull it up? Sure, we had a very brilliant RIU student last summer who we gave a project to that we didn't know whether it would work, but it looks like it did work. And what you do is you assume that the polarization uh, that you see in Planck, if most of the dust along any line of sight out from the sun is in the local bubble, you can assume that most of the polarization is like sort of the surface of last polarization, if you will, exactly. in the local bubble. And then you assume that the polarization normally just gives you the magnetic field projected onto the planet sky. But you know the third dimension if you say that the magnetic field is completely swept up into the surface of the local bubble. So then if you do that, you can actually build or infer a 3D map of the magnetic field, which we did Kate find it. It's like on, I have to go through like, it's on some Slack thread. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how many Slack threads I'll have to, to find this paper. Yeah, I'll find it. I think it may be in 3D Milky Way. It's in. 
Definitely Did I understand it's already published, or is this just it's, your it's about what press. file to look in? Here it is. It, I found it. I found it. I found it. It's, it'll be shown at the AAS in a press conference. Which one do you want to show, Alyssa? Show the one that looks like a, a cosmology map, or that one. Yeah. That one's fine. Can you make it real that is phenomenal. Yeah, uh, hold on. It's funny, it's so funny. The thing I have to do this afternoon is the press officer at the University of Virginia where Theo is a student wants me to write something like, why does this matter? Who would care about the magnetic field in 3D on the surface of the local bubble? Oh, well, I'll give a testimony. <laughs> what? Did you 3D print this? No, we need to though. Point for Glennis. Yeah, yeah, good, Thanks, yes. Glennis. Yeah. I didn't hear yes, what got I, said, but so I hope I approve. We checked it with, um, like polarization of background starlight, where you can also measure the distance to stars and know whether or not the polarization is arising at least some range of distances. And for where we can do that, it seems consistent. And Theo has also looked into like whether the dispersion in the field changes, where the topology of the bubble is interesting, and the answer is mostly yes. And so I think this is kind of right. It's what not, and I really do mean kind of right. It's not going to be perfect because there's a lot of assumptions involved, but I think it's it's vaguely right. One interesting thing about that is that if the from a you know we're a cosmology yeah. group here, yeah. and if the if the most of the like interesting line of sight interactions from the CMB are happening in the last yeah. three hundred parsecs, yeah. that could enormously simplify how we think about CMB mm -hmm. foregrounds and, I, and I, I said that to the fifteen yeah. years ago. I didn't huh. believe so please say that to him. <laughs> yeah, and like a lot of the, like we talk with Susan Clark a lot, and we talk with Gina Panopolo, who are both like magnetic field CMB people, and like being able to know where these gas clouds are, what their velocity is, and what their magnetic field properties are will be like life changing for CMB studies. And so like we're doing our part um, by looking at very very nearby gas. Clouds. I'll add that to the press thing. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. With um, Mikael Unger, we've been improving the large scale magnetic field of the galaxy and also the random field. And we've concluded we need such a thing to uh, optimally model the, the structure. So it'll be very interesting to see if the magnitude and, well, the general shape is kind of from the, the general knowledge of the local bubble that we, we had in mind and it was not very sensitive but it'll be very interesting to see if in more detail how similar uh we, we're far from publishing so you guys are way ahead i mean we're just it's part of the evolution of this general field model cool. did you want to know about the transverse motion of the radcliffe wave and the, your question about the motion. i don't believe the radcliffe okay. wave exists we, no, can, can we found it we found it's oscillating it's oscillating does that help it's that oscillating all secrets. it's oscillating it's, it has, it has i thought you were famous for writing papers saying that things don't exist <laughs> i i have met i i am very diverse <laughs> it's oscillating though Something. But we can argue about that. Maybe we should show you after. And does the Radcliffe wave like fit into this picture at all? Is it also part of this uh, supernova-driven structure? Or? Yeah. So we think actually this is this was Alyssa's crazy idea that turned out to not be so crazy. But if you actually trace back the motion of this three kiloparsec long section of the spiral arm, um, it actually we think that it could have been the source of these two clusters, UCL and LCC, and that it forms the it formed the gas, the gas that formed those clusters are associated, is associated with the Radcliffe wave and created the supernova that then created the local bubble in all these nearby star forming regions. Um, so. It feels to me like the future of this is that, you know, your, your kind of model was very simplistic that there's this explosion blowing up in a kind of uniform medium. Totally now wrong. we obviously know that that isn't the right. So it's more like this is about the interactions of many generations of such bubbles exactly. and and that makes a lot of sense i mean that makes it makes way more sense actually yeah. than yeah. when we learned about the this galactic fountain and it was yeah. like there's a slab of gas and the yeah. thing blew out of the gas yeah so we know of at least i would say like 10 to 15 cavities that mm -hmm. i believe um in in, in the solar vicinity and so we're working on trying to like verify these cavities find like the, like associated them with energetic activity figure out what their ages are, what is the general population, and how could these all evolve and interact with each other. Um, but that, I think, is like a, a few-year project rather than a project. Yeah. Yeah.
Oh, you want to see the screenshot from the planetarium? Okay, hold on. Can I ask you a question about the fields? Yeah. So if the bubbles have like the magnetic fields on the surface, and they're like a couple of them, and they're like touching each other, is there some sort of like electrical, some kind of gradient that's caused by the two magnetic fields, like with different vectors like touching each other, right? Like now this bubble has a charge, this one has it. That has to be like the connection yes. somehow. Yeah. You yeah. Can. Yeah. You can't paint a, a closed surface with magnetic fields. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's energy from the stars. We teach that. that. In that. <laughs> anyway, so this is this is um, this has been the planetarium last night. This is the Milky Way like galaxy. This is the local bubble in purple. This is the Radcliffe Wave, the thing that David Haw, uh, David does not believe. Uh, right here. We can argue about that. Um, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> 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 Okay, I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so yes. I think. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's take our speaker again. <laughs> Catherine, you're Could I talk to you about? How we can meet, and also is uh, I can't I couldn't hear or That's don't know. Alyssa, 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 Alyssa. 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 You want to come talk to, to Gladys? Yeah. And then there's and, and is who who is is it Alyssa? Yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah, it's Alyssa Goodman. Hi. I was guessing that was, uh, you know, made sense. Um, are are you how are around? Yeah, I'm a hub. Oh, you're a hub. Yeah. Oh, that's sorry. Just one second. I just found one. I don't know if you can see me. So give it a try. See what happens. You'll hit some box and let me know. And I saw Yeah. Did you connect to your play? No, I just I just shared my screen on Zoom. Oh right. Okay. Okay. So oh yeah yeah. Okay. So we can. And, from, and I heard that you're the we one that also make this at the end of school. I don't know that's true, but anyway. It's okay. Oh, it's yeah. probably. Yeah, there were, there's a lot of I was in. Uh, so I spent my summers in Heidelberg. Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> you, I remember <laughs> this was like years ago, but you're back. Bad, and you like, you're like, yeah. you're flying. Yes. <laughs> I think that's where we met. Right. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yes, there was a bad summer. But you. The, the, definitely there was a reaction to the uh, strings of dots or whatever it is uh, don't exist. Yeah. I mean, are, you, are you pro string or anti string? No, I'm, I'm a, I don't believe in any morphological Fabulous. features. Okay. I don't believe like in any you your I, Yes, exactly. I deny everything, <laughs> okay, so I was pleased. That's fine. But it is nice true. <laughs> but it, was, it is true. Hey, what's up? As long as you don't believe anything, I, that's I, fine. I, um, but uh, 